Ava, uh, one of the founding folks of the Ironic Project, and on the TC a while ago, I kind of took a break from OpenStack for the past couple years to jump into other emerging open source tech, like machine learning. Uh, in the last six months, I really jumped into demoing and putting some proof of concepts with TensorFlow and Keras on combining uh, big open data, uh, for example, Landsat. Uh, and open source hardware, or uh, sorry, open source uh, machine learning tools on commodity hardware. So I was here talking about one of those uh, projects. It's, it's kind of defunct at this point, but it could be spun up if anyone else is interested and wants to pick it up. Uh, it's called Firewise. We were trying to combine Landsat data with MTBS, uh, that is the burn severity database that is maintained by the US government for the last 15 years of fire data and see if we could predict where wildfires will happen before they happen. Now this is a tremendous amount of data and uh, we got some funding and some competition, uh, about $5,000 to do training and we spent it all experimenting. So it's not really published. Uh, some of it is, the code's kind of a mess at the moment because we're just hacking on it. Um, we ran out of funding before converging on a model that actually predicted fires. Uh, but our pipeline totally works. Uh, we can search various parameter spaces for different types of models, what's going to work, so far none of them, was, none of them did, and the, the two of the developers moved on to other projects. So as you're talking about that, uh, and really how anybody with a gaming computer, if you have an NVIDIA graphics card in your laptop or your computer at home, you can do machine learning. I gave a talk here and I gave a talk earlier in the week at the ML for All conference in Portland uh, on how to get started with a gaming computer yeah. and open source software and open data. And the easiest demo that I gave was how to build a Shakespeare chatbot. It's, it's simple and silly, but like take all the cluttered works of your favorite author and uh, sort of push that through an LSTM model and you get out a chatbot. So, so you could do like a J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter. Absolutely. You could do, oh yes. My God. Do it yourself. Uh, it's all Python. I demo it using uh, Jupyter notebooks just for the interactive demos. But once it's done, it's trained. You can take that model, load it up anywhere, oh. run it in the cloud, tie it up to your Twitter account. What are you going to do? Right? It's just a Python script at that point that uh, responds to texts like your favorite author. Ah, so I've been doing independent contracting for a while. Uh, a little over a year now. Um, can't say too much about it, but I've got some stuff coming up uh, about machine learning and privacy and spinning up soon. Uh, I've, from a background in OpenStack, I've done some security consulting for OpenStack companies or Kubernetes companies, uh, and I'm available for consulting if anyone wants to reach out. Awesome. How do people get in touch with you? Probably the best way to find me is either Twitter. Uh, Ava Voom, or you can ping me directly my email, ava at don't What do you want to work on in oh, the next six boy. months? Well, like maybe something that you are going to, and then maybe a pie in the sky project? So, things I am going to be working on is tinkering with machine learning still, and we keep poking at that. The, the field's evolving so rapidly, it's hard for anyone to stay on top of it. Uh, and I'm really interested in the, the sort of confluence of machine learning and edge compute and open source known hardware, of course. Um, but the industry is moving so much in that direction. We need more compute power closer to IoT devices, closer to smart cars or you know, whatever human interaction device is smart. We need machine learning execution close to that, not on the device. Mm -hmm. And so in that space, I want to make sure all the tools, infrastructure, dev tools, all of that are available and are open source. And so I'm in that space. This is sort of the, the big, part of the big push for 5G mm -hmm. um, is having higher speed connectivity between a device that is, let's say, battery powered. Mm -hmm. right? So you, your, your phone, for example, has a battery. You want to last at least a day, maybe two, right? It already has, if you have a, one of the flagship phones from any of the companies now, they have a Tensor chip. So they can do some basic machine learning 
execution on the phone. And facial recognition, right? Face unlock, word prediction, all that kind of stuff is happening with the tensor chip in your phone. But it's not training, it's only executing. Mm. So the, the customization, like taking your preferences and building the recommendation or sort of uh, learning you, that all has to happen somewhere off that device. It just isn't powerful enough yet. The other things like cars, like some driving cars, you gotta put that near the car but not on the car. So industry's moving in that direction. What other projects are you coming up high in the sky that you would like to work on? I mean, I'd love to see Ironic. It's sort of my own baby. I'm so proud of that project and I've been running it, but I'd love to see that being used at that edge now. Go, could you talk to me a little bit about how Ironic was founded? Uh, before I got into OpenStack, I used to do databases. Um, MySQL, consulting, high performance, scalability, all that. And none of my clients ever got good performance out of a database in a cloud. There's physical reasons for this, virtualization causes performance issues, uh, and so when I jumped into OpenStack, one of the projects was called Red Dwarf, which became Trove, and they needed bare metal databases in a cloud. At the same time, for CI CD process, we thought, what if the cloud could deploy a cloud? The only thing missing is the ability to orchestrate actual hardware. Tied those two requirements together, realized the entire HPC community needs the same thing. Several different you know, uh, business needs all got met with one project we piloted, and then I think, what, uh, Grizzly? I got it in, Ice House was the first real release, and it's just been you know, taken off ever since. It's a brilliant concept, and of course we need it, even though it's within the cloud, which is why it's named Ironic, I assume? Uh, well, you know, because it's ironic that a cloud would control iron, not VMs. Yeah. I'm terrible at names, but you should never let me name things again, because that's entirely my fault. Yeah. I think I, it's brilliant. Also, like, Portland is the hipster city of irony, and, well, uh, that product got named as I drove home from Portland after the Portland summit. <laughs> So. Awesome. Cool. And, and how does it feel now to like, uh, I know you attended PTG this week mm -hmm. and attended the ironic meetings. Yep. How does it feel to kind of see how far the project has come? I, I couldn't be prouder of the project and the team. Um, Julia and Lucas was here, Lucas has gone a bit, but Dimitri is still running things. I'm sad Jim wasn't here too. Like we almost had all four PTLs together, almost. But like, they're doing such a great job, and the project's healthy and thriving, and mm -hmm. I'm so happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my take on the, the summit PTG, as it's structured right now, mm -hmm. is it's about time. Um, as someone who was on the TC and PTL and working at a hardware company, often meeting with vendors at these events in the past, I was one of the loudest advocates for separating the PTG in the first place making sure they didn't overlap because me and everyone else in a similar role at other projects and other companies, we, we were dead by day two or three. Right? I'd fly in a day before the conference, maybe two for the board meeting, and then I got to be on stage talking, plus talking to customers, plus running the design sessions, and there was just no way I could do it all. So I'm really happy with the split. Talking to folks around here, everyone seems happy. Some folks are a little bit sad that it's like, well, we're here for seven or eight days, but the, the overall stress level is a lot less because nothing's ever going to happen. Are you tired? Of course, <laughs> but this is my fourth conference in back-to-back, -back, yeah. so that, that's why I'm tired. Yeah. And also having it less time out of the year is helpful. Like now that mm -hmm. instead of four times it's a year, you're traveling year. twice a year, so yes, it is longer, but it's only twice a year. And I hear that some products may still also have PTGs. So. They do. I just interviewed one today <laughs> that, uh, yeah, Cinder is going to do a mid-cycle meeting, which is smart. Like, if you really feel you need those four times a year, sure, right. price. And when, you have the resources. One of the things that I learned while running Ironic is um, trust. Building trust in a distributed team 
when you don't work at the same company as in the only excuse you have to see each other and do team building, get dinner, talk about your lives. It's so important to have that for um, faster communication, better communication, assuming good intent when someone comes to you with a challenging request. And, and that was ultimately why we, some of us, had mid-cycles was, yes, really we have to get work done. This is a key part of getting the work done. Human connection. Uh, in the brainstorming session, I think it was over lunch yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, I was writing a lot on the etherpad of uh, some travel tips for folks who don't think about InfoSec. Yes. The um, super short version is, uh, assume any digital device, any electronic device you bring into certain countries is going to be compromised. Data on it will be siphoned off and uh, malicious software and firmware will be implanted to go home with you. When I went to Buenos Aires, I huh. didn't think that country fell in the category of countries where I should be worried about this. Yes. Um, your cell phone, mm -hmm. it has the same um, function of technology that servers do, a, a baseband modem. Right? So the phone has the CPU and GPU that you're used to interfacing with, but underneath that is the baseband, and that's what talks to the cell tower. It has supervisory privileges over all software in the phone. The phone can't see it, it can see everything. Okay. Um, and it's when you connect to a new cell tower, especially the new carrier's cell tower, right. that cell tower can transmit uh, control instructions tell the phone how to change itself to work on that network. Mm -hmm. That's pretty wide open. Um, it's a very, it's a well-known backdoor into any cell phone. Uh, and certain countries and governments deploy this on, across their entire network, and certain countries don't regulate and actively police their airwaves. So anybody can run a cell tower that does this to phones. Uh, sure enough, when I got off the plane in Buenos Aires, my phone was hacked within 10 minutes. I don't know how many different sites were trying to hack it over the week that I was there. I threw the phone out. Like, like what do you do? Like, can you do a reinstall? No, or do, is no. your hardware just it's, it's toast. completely? Yep. Hypothetically speaking, somebody in the world probably could clean that, could have cleaned that phone, but it's above my skill level at um, firmware stuff. Because it's not about the operating system. Yes. Or like some malware got installed, and whoops, delete that app from my app store. It's not that. It's, it's the low-level firmware that runs the phone before the operating system's even loaded. Yeah. And BIOS. No, uh, it's the... It's before the BIOS. The equivalent if you have a laptop and it says um, vPro, Intel vPro. Mm -hmm. So vPro is their code word for enterprise class management software called Intel ME, Management Engine. Mm -hmm. That management engine is embedded in the Intel CPU and enables your office administrator to remotely access your machine, view your screen, manage firmware, all of that stuff. If it's not secured, then a hacker could do that. Your phone has the same kind of thing. It might be a thing. My advice would be buy a cheap Chromebook yeah, and a cheap cell phone. Mm -hmm. Don't put any of your keys on it. Mm -hmm. Set up a temporary password to access things, mm -hmm. write it on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to log into your systems that are based in the US, don't. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have to check your email, don't. Mm -hmm. Don't bring any of your work data, your corporate data, mm -hmm. passwords, any of that stuff. That'd be my advice. But that's, that's just the kind of standard that I've always operated with when I travel to lots of different countries. Yeah. I, have, I have an old phone, I think it's like a Samsung S5. Mm -hmm. It gets old that I use for this purpose. That's and it fine. is powered on when I land in the country. It's powered off when I leave. It never powers back on when I'm in the States. Really, all I need overseas is like maps and yeah. text messages. Yeah, exactly. Well, where am I going? What's my schedule? And how can I reach the few people I need to? Yeah, exactly. Dinner coordination. That's it. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is, are, do you have any final thoughts you would like to add? I mean, the open sack folks are like family, they're great. Yeah. We've been through all kinds of struggles together for seven, seven years now. 
I started in 2012, right? Like, yeah, springtime 2012. So this has been a, a journey. It's almost a lifetime. It feels like it. I feel like yeah. five years is a lifetime with each technology. Yeah. It's getting shorter too. Like seven years ago, five years with a technology was nothing. But now it feels like with so many, like there's AI, there's machine, there's uh, machine learning, there's the IoT, there's like, there's just so many technologies that are exploding. I remember when big data first became the new hotness. Uh -huh. And now it's yeah. old. Right, now everyone has big data. Now the, the, the buzzword is, um, the, the, is data lakes. So all the VCs want to hear is, do you have a data lake? Can you tell us what a data lake is? Data lake is VC um, code speak for, do you already have a bunch of proprietary confidential data from which you can extract meaningful, actionable things using the machine learning algorithm? Yeah, all the VCs at chat with like, well, that's a cool idea, but if you don't have you know, a data lake and a first mover advantage, we're not going to fund it. Yeah. Which makes sense. Actually, when every new business is powered by ML, yes. What I hope for in the world is that humans, every human's personal information can be treated and respected as private property, not a corporate right. And I don't think, well, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the big corporations are never going to do that on their own, because that's where they derive all their money. And it is open source as a movement, open source technology, and individuals collectively speaking up that might be able to make this happen. Uh, there's a couple projects out there. Uh, Solid from Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, is one of them that kind of interests me within this direction. There's a couple others I heard about this week. I forgot the name. Why, yeah. why does uh, Solid interest you the, the premise of solid is that every person could have a storage device there is like at their house or somewhere in the cloud it's theirs cryptographically theirs wherein all of their personal data your instagram posts your favorite restaurants all that stuff gets stored there and then you can determine what to share with different services so your favorites are yours and then you can let yelp use them to give you recommendations and then you could revoke that later. But Yelp doesn't own that. Whereas today, we sign agreements with every single piece of software we use that restrict our rights to the software, to the data, even to fix our own devices. Thanks, Apple. I'd like to see human rights restored in the field of software and hardware.